It spans the globe like a superhighway. It is called Internet. Millions of Americans own a personal computer. If you're one of them, you can now glimpse the future with nothing more than a modem, a phone line, and a few dollars a month. Open fire at Columbine High School. They said the gunman went from one area of the school to another, shooting students as they went. A student who witnessed the shooting said the gunman... Take the fact that he develops weapons of mass destruction. a major attack Very against serious. the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda network in Afghanistan. The people you liberate will witness the honorable and decent spirit of the American military. Light them all up. On college campuses, it's called the Facebook trance, glued to a website called thefacebook.com. Four hours later and you have no idea how you got there. With much of New Orleans now underwater, authorities are focused on search and Immigrants rescue. march while a city stands still. Organizers warn today's rallies and boycotts will paralyze Los Angeles. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. We got the first look today at what Apple says is the next big thing, the new must-have device. At least 30 people believed to be killed on the campus of Virginia Tech University. She broke down, sobbing about losing her only child. That is the atmosphere here on campus tonight. Do you have anxiety about going phoneless, constantly looking for new emails and text messages and calls, or do you use your phone in the bathroom? 2008 was a tumultuous year for the economy. The housing market collapse created one financial crisis after another, and it often seemed as if the news could only get worse. It could only get worse. Right here in Newtown, Connecticut, a mass shooting, and this time, Gunfire aimed at elementary school children. The polarization in the country in its latest research for the murder of George Coach Floyd turned violent across America. America. Like priest sex abuses dating back. Handle in some of the largest fires. The entire in state, state of California ordered to stay at home. That's for masks years. now centering on kids. Falsely asserted he actually was assaulted. Rioters. Yeah, Americans are dying. A report about social media and its effect on young children. children and at least two adults right now, killed. At least three children <laughs> are reported dead <laughs> after a shooting at Covenant School. They find the police all right in Nashville. The last 30 years, it's been a lot. We've been through, as a people, a lot of stuff. It would only make sense that we took some time to feel it, to give weight to the weighty things that have occurred. Right now, I feel like we're living in a society filled with anxiety. So I made up a word, angstxiety. It's the stresses, the feelings we all have living in this digital age. We're living in a time unlike any other time in all of human history. We've never had this amount of information hitting us. And it seems to be manifesting through a variety of mental health issues. And even if it doesn't manifest to that level, there's still that underlying feeling that we're all having. In this documentary, I hope to give a name to this feeling that we have. But then from there, I want this feeling to stop, and I bet you do too. So I explored what was going on with this idea of anxiety from a mental health angle. So it's my hope that we can find some things we can do so that the current reality doesn't have to be our future reality. I would like a more hopeful future. I would like a more optimistic future. I want things to get better, and I don't want anxiety to be our defining trait as a species moving forward. There's an alarming trend to report tonight on the state of mental health in our country. New numbers show depression is at an all-time high in the United States. Figures from a Gallup poll show nearly 30% of all adults have been diagnosed with depression at some point in their lives. It's, it's alarming what we found. Alex, it's alarming. If, if you go back to 2015, we'll just call that our baseline year, about 19% of American adults retrospectively reported that at some point in their lifetime then they've been diagnosed with depression. That had been slowly climbing up to 2019, but then something happens in early 2020 and that's the pandemic. Since that time, it's shot up pretty precipitously. So in our most recent measurement from a few months back, now 29% of American adults 
have, have said at some point in their lifetime they've been diagnosed with depression. Obviously a statistically significant increase, a meaningfully large increase. Ten percentage points, you can do the quick math uh, out of 258 million or so American adults, 18 plus. Oh, that's uh, 25, 26 million more people who are walking around today who've been diagnosed with depression than was the case back in 2015. So has there been any data or surveys that you've seen over the years that talks about this general angst in addition to the diagnosable issues that are occurring? Long-term trend is globally is negative. It has been slowly but steadily worsening uh, over time. These negative emotions um, uh, worldwide are on the rise while positive emotional experiences have been slowly eroding. Chairwoman Murray, Ranking Member Burr, Senator Murkowski, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Dr. Mitch Princeton, Chief Science Officer of the American Psychological Association. APA is the largest scientific and professional organization representing psychology in the U.S. For me, the polarization is a huge part of it. I mean, I just think that, I just think that you know, it's interesting. Social media is supposed to have brought us all together, but it's created these echo chambers. It's created this kind of sense of tribalism, you know, and we've depersonified each other. We're not, we're not people who recognize that we have more similar to each other than we have differences. We're people that, we're just follower counts now. And when you're just a number, it's very easy to be on one side or the other and not feel like you're, actually connecting with a real human anymore, much less that you're probably pretty similar to them. And members of the Judiciary Committee, thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Psychologists are experts in all human behavior, and we've been studying the effects of social media scientifically for years. Social media often offers the empty calories of social interaction that appear to help satiate our biological and social needs, but do not contain the healthy ingredients necessary to reap benefits. You know, so many people are asking like, why are we talking about mental health more? Is it because people today just aren't as resilient? I say, no. <laughs> people are actually, if you think about everything that people are dealing with, I think people are being more resilient now. We're talking about the end of the planet. We're talking about neighbor versus neighbor kind of physical violence. And think about the daily hurt and insults and fear, school shootings, you know. And we're so connected globally that if something happens across the world right now, I feel it within minutes. You know, obviously not as much as someone who's experiencing it in person, but it's not just a piece of the six o'clock news that I'll hear once a day. I'm gonna see every bit of communication and struggle and stress about it on a continuous feed instantaneously. Even if your levels of anxiety doesn't reach a diagnosable level of a general anxiety disorder, anything like that, there's still an underlying current that everybody yep. seems yep. to be feeling. Yep. You know, regardless of what you believe yep. or... There's, there's a tendency to look back and see, for some people, to look back and see it as a better time in the past. Kids could ride their bike to school and you could leave your house unlocked. And, but some of that is fancified. Yeah, it's it's a, Yeah, and, and not accurate. Right. Um, but even, even when you look back in a way that isn't so intensified. Uh, times are still worse now. There's more uh, conflict, there's more tension, there's more things to worry about that maybe a few kids would know about in the past, now everybody knows about it. Um, and of course those topics are more in number. What happened? Everybody was having fun. What changed? I'm an, I'm an optimist by nature, and I, I see reasons to be hopeful about the future. Uh, and I see patterns and cycles over time, uh, from conservative to liberal to liberal to conservative, 
and sometimes the pendulum swings farther and sometimes it's just a little blip. And right now I think we're at a high point about worries, concerns, divisiveness, uh, people not agreeing, and not even agreeing to disagree, but being unwilling to think of the other person's perspective. We did a study very recently looking at how adolescents who are what we call kind of habitually checking their social media. They're checking their, media, their social media multiple times a day, um, constantly looking for updates or posts or likes or, or whatnot. These are adolescents who are constantly checking their social media. And then we scanned their brains um, every year for three years to see how their brain was changing. And what we find is that the adolescents who are habitually checking their social media are showing increases in the way that the brain is responding to its social environment. In these brain regions that are sensitive to like salient, important social stimuli. So like receiving likes or getting feedback from peers. They're showing increased activation over the teenage years in these brain regions. Whereas adolescents who are not habitually checking their social media are actually showing decreases in these same brain, brain regions. So there seems to be this kind of um, differential, this very different developmental trajectory for those who are not checking their social media habitually and for those who are checking their social media habitually. Does what happens at that age shape the rest of your life? Great question. The, the brain changes and adapts to its environment constantly across a lifetime, but perhaps more so during adolescence because it's going through this phase of change and sort of getting ready to be a grown up. And so we think that the changes that are happening in adolescence and during periods of development are, are very important for what the brain is gonna be like throughout adulthood. That's not to say it's irreversible, the brain continues to change and develop, but it is setting the stage for development into, into the adult years. So if you go back, I'll say 40 years, okay. um, mental health services were in a certain style. They were, if you wanted to be harsh, hand-holding, if you wanted to be intellectual, analytic, uh, but, but they were sit in an office and talk. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the therapist would be more active, but mostly they were passive listeners and supportive. That shifted. Mm -hmm. um, behaviorism in part responsible for that, evidence in part responsible for that. So now there's more action, there's more doing. Uh, if there's a conflict, it's not a matter of analyzing your past experience, it's let's bring in the people, let's work out a solution and let's try it. Mm -hmm. So it's more forward looking, more action oriented, um, less passive and analytic. Uh, and that, that shift has been widespread in psychology. For, for youth, and youth with anxiety or angst anxiety, um, it fits very nicely. Um, anxiety is an issue where you anticipate catastrophes, you think all these things could happen, right. and they could, right. but they're not probable. So possible, but not probable. So we're in a building, 10 stories on the news, maybe a month ago there was a building that collapsed in Turkey, when I came in the building this morning, I'm not thinking this building's gonna collapse. Right. Even though it's possible, mm -hmm. but it's been here for 30, 40 years. Uh, there are many, many more buildings in the world that didn't collapse. Just because it was in the news that one did, doesn't mean this one will. But anxious people will find reasons to worry. I went to the mall a week ago in Wisconsin, and I had the thought, is there a shooter? Yeah, yeah. And I never used to have that thought. That's right. And then I told myself, no, there's not. Yeah. It didn't make me feel any better. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, from the perspective of helping kids with anxiety and stuff, the first time it might not make you feel better. That's only one time. But if you were to go to the mall 20 times, each time testing the belief, is there a shooter or not, and there isn't, that number of trials would have an effect where you'd go back on, yeah, I've, I've thought that a few times it never happened the experience disconfirms the anticipated catastrophe. Right, still an awkward subject to even have the thought of. Yeah. The building collapse almost seems more normal. Yeah, well, right. the shooting thing, again, a kid who's, let's say, 12, 
if he doesn't watch the news 10 years ago or 20 years ago, doesn't know that there was a shooting in Texas. Now, everybody knows, every channel has news, and on their phone they're getting pictures of it. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of constant barrage of the unlikely but possible catastrophes that are making people think they're all over the place and happening all the time. When it's just hyped up because of the frequency that you see it. Right. So it, it's almost hard where, how could that not become a lot of people's worldview? Yeah. When, when, our, when our worldview is this, seeing the world through this, it paints a different picture of reality, yeah. doesn't yeah, it? It does. What I'd like to have happen for a more hopeful future is for people to take the internet and other things and go, yeah, there was a building that collapsed in Turkey, but there are 17 million other buildings that didn't collapse. There are 10,000 other shopping malls where there wasn't a shooting. And take apart the news effort to get you interested with, you know, catastrophe porn, if you will, and, and have it be something that people look at differently. They go, oh yeah, that's the one thing. It's probably not gonna happen, but it's newsworthy because they want me to be interested. And if you can take it apart that way, maybe that'll not have us have this worldview of everything's dangerous. And letting the data be the convincing part to change your perspective. Just arguing can sometimes lead to this, and an adult telling with an emphasis on teachy, preachy, a kid leads to, you don't know, you're an old fart. You, you know, you don't know. Um, so it's gotta be, I don't know, but let's try it out. And then the kid learns from the experience on their own. That, that's impactful. What happens very frequently when people are anxious or depressed is their focus is inward. So part of the trap of anxiety is it makes you obsess about yourself when sometimes the answer is found in others. Yeah. It's all about being interiorly focused, whether it's focused on your thoughts focused on your mood, focused on your bodily sensations. Everything is constant inward. And sometimes when you tell people, advise them to go and do things for other people, like maybe volunteer, go work for a charity, go work in a soup kitchen, go help somebody who has less than you. Those experiences give people like some evidence that they were not paying attention to, which maybe my life isn't that bad. Maybe there's other things I can do that actually feel good. And just giving somebody a hand can feel really good. You can feel good about yourself and you can feel good about what you did for someone else. And that's what people need when they're not doing anything, when they're sitting home and they're not talking to their friends and they're not going places and they're not taking care of the things they need to take care of, not only do not they not get the goodness out there, they're heaping the negative on themselves. So, oh, I should be doing this and I should be doing that. And then they're not. So they're not happy with themselves. And then sometimes socially, they might actually be letting down their friends and family, right? Because they're not feeling great. They didn't want to go to their friend's party, not because they don't like their friend, but because they're too depressed. And so they don't go. And it isn't just that they missed a party, but they, their friend now is disappointed because they don't understand why they didn't come. And U.S. Surgeon General has issued a new advisory on loneliness as a health issue. Research reveals that in the hours following social media use, teens paradoxically report increases rather than decreases in loneliness. So here's something I've seen, and yeah. I've seen it a lot. I'll be walking in my subdivision in a small town. Yep. Somebody will see me from a distance, mm -hmm. then the, the face touching starts. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, someone there. And then it's the phone. The phone yep. gets pulled out, and there's like, do I pretend I'm busy? Do I? And it's like there's yep. this panic of how to even say, hey, how are you? Yeah. Yeah. Have you noticed that change? Is it just oh, me? No, absolutely. I mean, it's it's so funny because as I drive my kids to school every day, there's a bus stop and there's a whole bunch of kids there and they're all staring down at their phones. And I'm thinking, you're not just missing out on fun. You're missing out on a, a psychological requirement of interacting, learning social rules, learning about morality, emotion, 
social development, intellectual development. This is the way that kids develop, is in a social context. You take away that social context, you're affecting all those areas of development. So those kids sitting at the bus stop, scrolling through TikTok videos, they're actually missing a learning experience in that moment. Hmm. And what we know in psychology is, you miss a learning experience, you have fewer skills, so you do worse at the next opportunity to learn, and it becomes a snowballing effect. I think a lot of what's come with the age of Netflix and comfort and food delivered that it almost prevents experiences these days. What are your right. thoughts there? Avoidance is a pattern of making responses that you think are necessary, but they're not. But it makes you feel safe. So if you think, oh, the world's not safe, so I'm gonna order food delivered. Oh, the world's not safe, so I'm not gonna go to the mall. I'll have my clothes delivered and if they don't fit, I'll send them back. All of which is unfounded in the sense that it's not necessary, but it's more convenient. And if you, let's say, have food ordered in and have your clothes ordered in and shelter up a little bit and you don't get hurt, you don't get shot, you don't get violated in some way, then you think to yourself, see that? It worked. So the actions of avoidance produce a rewarding sense for the person who's avoiding because they say, see that? I'm safe. When in fact, you didn't need to have your food delivered or have your clothes delivered to be safe. But they did it that way, nothing bad happened, so they think it was necessary. It confirms that mistake. And so the more people are huddling in uh, and avoiding, it, it's going to be confirmed for them that they should be doing that, and it's not going to get better. What needs to be done to get it better is don't huddle in, get out there in the world, uh, experience it and find out the catastrophes typically don't happen. One therapist took a kid to rock climbing. She was afraid to go to a birthday party, uh, afraid to go to certain events with peers, didn't feel athletic, uh, unwilling to try. Um, therapist took her to an indoor rock climbing place where they strap you in. She did it. They took pictures. She then showed the pictures to her friends, and her friends were having a birthday party that included a rock climbing thing. She went, all of a sudden it was like social world opened up. We didn't sit in the office and talk about rock climbing. That's not the same. It's the therapist had the energy, the confidence. Let's go. Even if you go up just two rocks, we'll just go. Let's, let's do it. And then I'll go up two more rocks. You're strapped in, you know, you're here. Let's do it. And then the kid did it, and, you know, they sort of, get empowered by that. Um, that's the active ingredient, is being willing to get out there and do it. How normal is this idea across the country of getting out and doing stuff with people, getting out of the chair? Uh, is this the standard? No. No. Um, for some reasons that I think are legitimate, some places you're not allowed to take clients or patients out of the office, but there are probably many, many more reasons that are unfounded. Like, it's not a good idea. It is a good idea. Uh, the, the other approaches to working with youth sometimes will say, well, I don't want to damage my relationship if something were to go wrong. Well, you're just modeling being fearful. You got you to be willing to give it a go. Uh, and if something doesn't go perfectly well, you say, all right, that didn't go well, let's try something else. Um, and that willingness communicates a lot. Over the pandemic, we suddenly realized that all those little interstitial water cooler greetings and smiles, turns out they all meant something. Because when you take them away, even though we can replace some of it with Zoom, when you take away those little things, it adds up to something really important. It's little things in so many different topics. Yeah. And it's like the chisel, just, it just doesn't end. And you're getting hit from all fronts. Like, pick any topic, any subject, there's probably a controversy that pops into mind immediately. We know that big life stressors has an impact on us, but people don't realize that it's all the little daily hassles that can actually add up to be just as bad. So sure, someone passes away or we lose a job or we have a major illness. We know 
that that's gonna cause all kinds of changes in the brain, in the body. It changes how we see the world over time because literally our brain is changing our, our filters for how we sense future stress. It lowers our threshold for what seems stressful. Um, but all these daily hassles, it does the same thing. It's, it's genuinely changing every cell of our body in a way that makes us more susceptible to inflammatory related diseases and more susceptible to stress. And our cells start turning on DNA to produce an inflammation reaction. And that probably makes sense because if you were about to be attacked by a, an animal, you would need your blood to clot and you would need to ward off potential infection. Today, if you're like defriended off of social media or something like that, or you have a daily hassle, you probably don't need an inflammation response, but evolution takes time. So we still have this intracellular response at the moment we experience stress, especially social stress today. And that's activating all the time for us now. One of the students came and she said, um, I noticed she was having some anxiety and she was having some hard time fitting in. And I said, what's, what's the deal? And she goes, I just, I haven't made any friends. I don't know how to make friends. And I'm like, well, you know, when you go to class early and talk to students, you know, they're sitting around waiting for the class to start. And she goes, I tried that, they're all on their phones. You know, so, you know, the, the methods that we had, like for making friends and just striking up conversations, how's the weather, you know, so what'd you do this weekend? When you're walking in and everybody's on their phones, you, you're not having those conversations. So what does she do? She picks up her phone and starts scrolling through her phone too, because you're socially awkward. You don't want to be the one sitting in the room, just staring, looking around. So you just pick up your phone and you start doing what everybody else is doing. And we talk about what success really is in life. It's having deep social connections. It's having people that you care about, that love you and you love them, that you're making an impact. And so when we're not having that anymore, I think it leads to this sense of emptiness. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm going through all the motions and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but I'm empty. And we're having more suicides, we're having more you know, panic attacks, we're having all these other things happening. And it's like, because the, the connection's not there. There was a really interesting study that was done by looking at the diaries of um, adolescent uh, females back in the 1900s and then comparing them to the, you know, comparable diaries of today. And it, you know, it used to be filled with things, apparently the researcher had found, um, about making a connection to society and being part of a community. And in the span of just a hundred years, our technological advances have really changed to, I, I want to be famous, I want to you know, have the most money, I want to have the most power. And it's interesting, when you live in a world where you never have to leave your house, everything can be delivered to you, you can work from your, your own living room, we've lost the one thing that made us human. You know, we've lost the most important thing. And this is where I think we've just lost our way as a species because the only reason why we're here is because of that social connection. So, you know, 60,000 years ago, there were many human-like species on the planet, five, six different, you know, they all could have survived. In fact, they were bigger and stronger and hardier. Um, we were the only ones that had the genetic mutation that developed language, which made us a community. And the only reason why we're here is social connection. And now tons of things are taking that away from us. When you think of it on that frame, that's really concerning. It really is. We're taking away the one thing that led to our survival. Community. Community. Relationships. Connection. Connections. Cooperation. Yeah. Love. Yeah. Really. You know, here's a thought that struck me on this trip. It was that love means nothing unless there's somebody else in relation to it. So you need somebody else for love to even exist. Yeah. And yeah. we live in a world now where you don't need anybody. I mean, you do, but it's easy to not. Is CBT not just a form of community? So I, I, I define community a little different, but if I'm flexible with that definition, I think it is, but a little qualifier. Psychology can sometimes make terminology like psychotherapy sound like magic and sound like only wizards can do it and this kind of thing. Um, I see mental health services as education about how to think and experience things and how to feel and make sense of it. And if you think of it as education and learning, 
Anybody can do it. Most people who are credentialed have a little bit more knowledge about how to do it, who have a little bit more practice and supervision about how to do it. They're, more, less, they're less likely to make mistakes, but anybody could do it. So in the sense of, isn't it just community? The answer is yes. People who want to have healthy kids and share experiences, help them make sense of it, et cetera, that's all the big, the big community thing. Um, I'd say that, that there's a yes in that. If you think about earlier generations, um, I can think about my grandparents and parents who were not very um, psychologically minded. Yeah. Nobody talked about feelings. <laughs> no. That was just not done. You don't have them. You're not allowed to have them and don't even talk about them. So, you know, we've evolved and we've changed and we've grown and we're now saying it's okay. Emotion regulation is a huge, huge skill. We all need to be able to do that. If what is happening now had happened in a time where we were not willing to talk about feelings at mm. all, how much more of a disaster mm. would we be in? So really, we are becoming equipped with the tools to overcome the negatives. Mm -hmm. You think that's fair to say? I do. Um, or is that too idealistic? <laughs> <laughs> We've never in the history of our species outsourced our social lives to a computer. We've, we've never told a computer to pick who we're friends with and what order we communicate with them, um, who we should pay attention to and, and what new friends we should go make. We, we now have a computer doing that for us. Let's take social interaction back. Right. You know, it's as easy as walking up to somebody and saying hello. Hi, my, I mean, hi, my name's Alex. Right, right. <laughs> like, Good to meet you. It's as easy as, as just starting a conversation. And you know, it's not, it's not radical and it doesn't mean throwing away your phones, but no. it's, just, it's just going someplace and putting your phone down and taking care of yourself and not being, we're, our brain is not able to handle, we call it cognitive overload, the amount of information you get. If I'm, if I'm waiting online at the grocery store, I mean, I could be reading seven current event stories, checking my social media. That's just a lot of information when 20 years ago, that was time we would just listen to that horrible music and maybe chat with the, the person in front of us in the cart in front of us. And, and that was good for us. That's an emotional roller coaster we're going through every time we pick up our phone. Maybe not a very dramatic one every time, but it's not an emotionally neutral experience. And just processing and dealing and reacting to all those emotions, it leads us to create shortcuts like, all those people are bad, or I don't care about any of this anymore, or I can't pay attention to the parts of my life that matter anymore. That's the price we're paying. So what have I learned with all of this? Well, I've learned that something needs to change, and not just something, but many things. And that's the problem. Inks anxiety is not something that can be solved with just an algorithm tweak. No, it's much bigger than that. It's much more interconnected than that. So specific answers might not fix this. So what do we, the people, need to do? Well, we, the people, agree to start over with each other. We, the people, need to recognize that things aren't working. We, the people, need to stop labeling each other. Oftentimes, you see somebody, you see their shirt, you make judgments, you hate them. We need to stop. We need to learn the value of what it means to be human again. We need to learn to pair regular human interaction that our brains crave and pair that with the tech world. If we don't figure this out, we're never gonna make things better. And we're never gonna make things better unless we come together. And we're never gonna come together unless we agree that we need to start over. Because everybody on different sides, they all have good reasons and good convictions and reasons why the other side is just wrong, potentially even evil, right? I get it. I hear you, 
But hear me. It's time for unity. It's time to start over. What if we just agreed to clean the slate? Let things go in order to create a better, more perfect future of unity. Alex, you're being too idealistic. Maybe I am, but everything I heard from the people I interviewed, they all agree. We need to recognize, we need to feel, and we need to do stuff again. The insidious part of a lot of mental health issues is it prevents us from doing things. It traps us in ourselves. This is not a recipe for a better, more service-based world. But our current reality doesn't have to be our future reality, and I have to believe that. We'll see what happens. You're only getting braver 